Come on, let's stand together. Jesus has overcome, and we're going to declare in this place. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. Now the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry let the earth be spawned. All creation shout with a voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. Come on, sing it with us. Let's lift our voices and let's sing it out. He shall reign. Every fear, listen to this. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. For the reason one is overcome, we will not be moved. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the reason one is overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. powerful name of Jesus and nothing can stand against him. Come on, let's declare what a beautiful, wonderful and powerful name, the name of Jesus.
powerful name. What a powerful name. Darkness has to tremble to the name of Jesus. Do you believe that? The Bible says that every name that has a name must bow to the name of Jesus. It means coronavirus, it has to bow. It's just a name. It's not more powerful than Jesus. There's power in his name that nothing can stand against. Nothing. He has no rival. He has no equal. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is on the throne. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just lift your hands with me like this? We're going to sing that bridge again. You have no rival. Sing this with me. Lift your hands and worship. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Sing it again. You have no rival. You have no rival. Think about that. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. You have. You have no rival. You have no It is his breath that is in our lungs. And together, we're gonna to declare the greatness of our God because no matter what we're facing, we're gonna lift him up and give him praise for he is worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Say this with me, you give life. You give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Come on, you sing it, great. Great are you, Lord. You give life, you give life. I love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord come on let's declare it it's your breath it's your breath Give a lie. 
shout this out today. All the earth will shout your praise. Everything inside of us. Come on, stand in your homes and lift your voices because he's worthy. We're going to shake off fear. We're going to shake off doubt. Everything that stands against us because Jesus Christ is for us. And who is for us? If God is for us, who can be against us? You ready? one more time. It's your breath in our lungs. Lift your voices. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Thank you, Jesus. Pour out our praise, Jesus. Lord, you are great. Well, the amazing thing about a light is that it shines brightest in a dark room. And right now, our country, this world is in a dark situation. There's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of unknown question marks. But Lord, you are still great and you are still God. And you are shining brighter than ever. Lord, I pray that anyone that's participating with us right now this morning, if there's any lack of faith, if there's loss of hope, Lord, that you would bring it. Lord, that you would bring a peace beyond all understanding because you are great and you are still God. And we believe that this morning. In your name we pray, amen, amen, amen. Again, I want to say we are so glad that you are participating with us this morning. Here's one thing I want you to know. We are so thankful for your generosity. Every dollar that's coming in right now is making a huge difference. It's because of you that we are able to feed the hungry and to take, take care of those who are in need. And so thank you for that. Now, if you want to continue to give, to give back to God through CR First, go to our website. Go to crfirst.org. There you're gonna find multiple ways that you can give that is safe and is secure. You can also use our app, or if you simply wanna mail in a check, you can do that as well. But again, thank you so much for trusting God with your finances during this time because we wouldn't be able to be one church in many locations without you. So thank you. Now this morning, we have some more information for you, so check this out. My name is Amanda, and I want to welcome you to Cedar Rapids First Online. If this is your first time joining us, we are so glad to have you. 
We want to make sure we are staying connected with each of you, so be sure to fill out your Connect card online. You can find the Connect card by clicking Connect on our website at crfirst.org or on our app. You can also fill out a prayer request form. We are praying for every individual need during this time. We would be honored to pray with you, so please allow us the privilege of staying connected with you in prayer. If you haven't downloaded our app yet, you can find it by searching CR First in your app store. Our app is a great resource for the latest updates, staying connected, and watching our services. Ladies, we are still able to bring you the Going Beyond simulcast with Priscilla Shiver on Saturday, April 25th. The cost is only $10, and you need to register by this Wednesday, April 22nd. Your registration will include a redemption code so you can access the simulcast in your home. You are not going to want to miss this event. As we navigate our new normal, we will have live services and pre-recorded content available throughout the week. So be sure to connect with us on social media as our pastors and staff will be releasing regular content to help encourage us and help us grow deeper in the Lord. You can also watch our previous services on YouTube and Facebook. If you know someone who could benefit from this experience, please share it with your friends. Remember, we may be socially distant, but we will never be relationally distant. So in 1950, the 11th Duke of Devonshire found himself facing a 7 million pound inheritance tax. And as many people do in that situation, and I've never been in that situation, maybe you haven't been in that situation, but what he first thought was, what do I have to sell? What can I sell to pay that off? And as he looked through the estate, he came across three paintings, all done by Rembrandt. And so he worked through the process and eventually in 1957, assigned Rembrandt, the old man in an armchair, which was originally painted by Rembrandt in 1652, went to the National Gallery in London in exchange for his tax bill that he had to pay. What's interesting about this painting, though, is just a little over 10 years later, an art historian named Horst Gerson labeled that painting as a follower of Rembrandt, not an authentic Rembrandt, that it was painted by someone else who, who liked Rembrandt. And, and in fact, over the years, it had even been featured in different fakes and mistakes, uh, just different uh, documentaries and lists that people have put, and it still is on display, but not on display as an actual Rembrandt, but as a follower of Rembrandt, a possible person connected to him. That is until 2014. And in 2014, Dr. Ernst von Wetterling of the Rembrandt Research Progress, who is really, at this point, is the most renowned Rembrandt expert in the world, looked at the painting closely and came back with the conclusion, this is indeed a Rembrandt. If you're confused, many people are, okay, is it a Rembrandt? Is it not a Rembrandt? Right? This is kind of the process that's been happening with the Rembrandt connoisseurship over the last century. You see, in the beginning of the 20th century, most people believed that Rembrandt had painted anywhere from 600 to 650 paintings, all of them of incredible value you know, at, at this point. But from 1970 on, a group of scholars had started working and kind of nitpicking things apart to the point where it's down now the catalog of Rembrandt's is down to about 250. And what people have been debating is over what makes something that was created by a master. How do they know this was created by the master, that this is an authentic, original painting? How do they determine the strokes and the techniques and the, the lighting and the composition that all put together to make something, uh, the signature, really, that the signature of the master is real? I'm so grateful to be with all of you today as we gather together if there's one church in multiple locations if i haven't got a chance to meet you yet my name is pastor brian and and i love the fact that we can still connect with each other and communicate come into god's presence right whether we're in our home or wherever we might be this morning or around the different times during the week that this is an opportunity that we have to experience the presence of god together this last week has been an amazing week around here at Sierra First. It was Easter week. And so not only was our Good Friday service, just a powerful time. And again, all those services are, are available online for you to experience in the full. And we don't want to just have people just 
tune in or just view things. We want it to be a participatory experience that we can encounter the presence of God. Because when two or more agree on something, his presence is there. And we also had a great Easter morning service that hope is not canceled, right? Hope's not canceled because hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And I love that many people gave their lives to Jesus at the end of the message last week. And then uh, part of that too, we gave out hope kits, well over uh, several, many hundreds of hope kits. And I think about close to 300 hope is not canceled signs are out throughout the community. And we love the fact that people are encouraging neighbors and all the fun texts that people got from their neighbors as, as kids went and did egg hunts and searched and just brought joy to our neighborhood. And then Sunday night, those that were able to come in the bad weather, even as we had our drive-in experience, we just had a blast. Um, it was just a lot of fun, a lot of horn honking and, and waving and just a, a great time just to be together and to take pictures and just to have a good time. And here we are today. And, and today what I want to do is we're going to start a new series for the next couple of weeks. And we're going to do a series called The Signature of God. And in this series, we're going to look at those things that help us understand what it is that makes something a masterpiece, right? In Ephesians 2.10, Paul writes this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. What I want us to look at is how do you know that God is at work in your life? How do you know that God is doing something in you, working through you, making sure that you understand his signature on your life. There are a lot of people in this world that are, that maybe they like Jesus' teaching, but they're not really signed by God. And I want us to, all of us know fully, what does it take to see our lives changed? And in some ways, this series is going to be a little bit more theological. It's going to be a way for us to dig deep in scripture. And in fact, during these weeks, as many of us have time, and even the governor again, kind of, um, up some things for us again this, this week with being at home and working at home and making sure we're very, very careful uh, amidst of this global pandemic, but that we take some time not just to get in the word, but also to let the word get into us. There's going to be a lot of scriptures, and so I encourage you to take notes or find the notes on the Bible app or on our app or online there, and, and we're going to dig into some things. We're going to help us really wrestle through, and, and it's going to be theological, but it's also going to be very raw and very real. See, the reason Rembrandts have been under kind of this weird framework, it's actually a very interesting read and an interesting study, but there has been a lot of ego and a lot of groupthink and a lot of hyper-criticism over the authenticity of different paintings. And those are the kind of things that we want to strip away. Right? Those things have no business in the church, no ego and, and groupthink or hyper-criticism. What we're going to do today is we're going to start with a verse that is probably one of, another one of my life verses. It has had a profound impact on me. And the verse is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Primarily verse 18, but let's start in verse 16. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I mean, just pause there for a second. What, what that means is when Jesus died, there was what we know is recorded in scripture. There was a veil or kind of a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from outside. And it says when Jesus passed away, that, that the veil that separated where God's presence was seen to be kept and people saw this was where God's presence was, was, was removed. So the barrier between the natural and the supernatural was removed. And really, that's more so what he's referring to here. That this barrier between the spiritual world and the natural world, Jesus was able to remove a barrier. And then it says, for the Lord is the spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Now, th this verse is so many things, and I wish we had t all kinds of time to dig into it, but we're going we're gonna to look at it. And there's two key words, really, as you dig into it, and um, kind of some of my Greek background is helping understand the framework for what this is saying. Our translators do a phenomenal job with taking things, but sometimes there's some nuances that deepen uh, the, the dynamics. 
And the first, when we see that phrase, it says to see and reflect. It really is, is one word that we can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. This katotripsomai, right? Katotripsomanoi, something like that. None of you look it up later. It's, it's, it's great fun. Um, but, but what the word is saying is, is that we can see like in a mirror, Right? That there's a mirror that we can reflect and see and see something. But what's beautiful about the passage is Paul's writing here, it's, it's the tense that he uses. He's saying you will continuously gaze. That you will be fixated. That you will be captivated. That, that you can't take your eyes off of him. That when you look into God's presence and you look in trying to reflect his glory like in a mirror and see him, that you can't not just help but being transfixed by the beauty that God is. And then it has this phrase where it says, and we will be changed. So the more we gaze upon him, it says, then we will be changed. And that word is a word is probably more familiar, metamorphomai. Or you understand the word metamorphosis, right? from a caterpillar to a butterfly. What Paul's saying is when we gaze upon Jesus, that the metamorphosis to change the essential form and nature of something, that the inward reality of what something is is completely different changes so i want to look at the signature of god today and what i want to start with is the signature of god is transformation that every time we're around him that's what we're going to see transformation happen and i want to take some time with this because i think too often in the church and in our culture when people think about religion and the church we, we totally misunderstand what this means. Because the transformation we're talking about is not about making improvements. Right? This, is, this is not self-improvement or getting better. Uh, we're not talking about a transformation that, that brings conformity. Uh, that makes you like groupthink and makes you like other people and other situations. We're, we're not all the same. But in fact, there's, there's not one culture. We'll get to that in a second. And this, is, this kind of transformation is not an event. It's not something that you just go to once. No, this, is, this is something way beyond this. This verse tells us this is an incredibly big deal. That we are going to get a complete life transformation. That when you continually gaze into the presence of God, that, that, that there's nothing you can do to get better. You, you can't make your life better just by going to church. There's nothing you can do to behave your way differently. There's, there's nothing that's going to socialize you into a new group of people and make sure you behave in a right way. Or, or there's nothing you can watch that can change you. Now, this type of transformation that we're talking about takes place only in the presence of God. When we say the signature of God is in our life, it can only happen in the presence of God. There's nothing that we can learn. There's nothing that we can read. Uh, there, there isn't anything, but we have to continually gaze upon his beauty, gaze upon his glory, and that's what will transform you. See, remember, this type of transformation, this is a spiritual transformation. This is not a physical change. Like when you get saved, nothing in you physically changes. I think a lot of us wish it would, but nothing does. Uh, nothing in you emotionally changes when you get saved. When, when you come to Jesus, nothing in you intellectually changes. In, in fact, even your psychological framework and, and makeup and how you approach life, none of that changes. But what Jesus did on the cross is when he went to the cross and he died, and, and it says that that veil was torn that separated the inner sanctuary, the presence of God that the people of that time thought that's where God's fullness of his presence came, is that the spiritual world is now fully open to you and your spiritual life can be transformed. Here's one thing we know about religion. Religion is all about conformity. If you look at any religion in the world, you're going to see conformity. You're going to see things in Buddhist religion and, and Islam and, and all kinds of different religions. Right? And even in Christianity, a lot of times it's about conformity. But true followers of Jesus are not about conformity. It's not about our dress or how we pray or when we pray or the type of vocabulary that we use or even the way we're socialized. I remember when I was in college, I worked at a place and, and overhearing two co-workers talk about how Christians are really, they have their own subculture. Yeah, they have their own clothing lines, they have their own bookstores, they have their own music, that they're really their own subculture. 
So that's not the plan of Jesus' type of transformation. He's not trying to change us into a subculture. In fact, let's look at Jesus interacting with somebody in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, there's this man named Nicodemus. He is a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And, and after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. So he was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. And he was in conformity. And because he was interested in something outside of the, conf- the norm, he went to Jesus at night so other people wouldn't see him. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man get back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can only reproduce human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. See, Nicodemus at this point only knew Jesus as teacher. And there are a lot of people, even in, in our culture today, only know Jesus as a teacher. They liked what he said. They liked how he communicated. They liked the things that he's teaching. But what Jesus is telling him is, no, you have to be open to the spiritual. There's something beyond the natural that I am going to do in your life. You have to have a spiritual rebirth, something new that comes alive in you that wasn't there before. Because when the spiritual nature is alive and wakened, but here's, here's the beautiful part. It now comes first. And so our physical lives are now directed by our spirit, should be. Our, our emotional life are now come second to our spiritual life. Our, our psychological approach to things are now secondary to our spirit. Our intellect is now being informed by our spirit. Right? And, and one way to think about it, there's a new driver at the wheel. We've talked about before the last couple of weeks that sometimes we live hell up or we live heaven down. And hell up means I, I live with my physical first. I live with my, my intellect first. I live with my socioeconomic status first, my, my ability to work hard. I, I live with all those things first, me first. But what God is saying, no, I want you to live from heaven down. I want it to be spirit influencing every other part of your life. This is why for true followers of Jesus, there is no culture. There's no one culture that should identify, well, oh, look at them. That's the culture, right, of, of, a, of a Christ follower. No, I've been all over the world. And Christ followers have so many different cultures. There is not one language that all Christians and Christ followers should speak. You know, there's multiple languages. There's not one social group. There's not one economic group. But we are all united because our spirits have been transformed. And because our spirit is first, there is no division by race. There is no division by language. There is no division by by any background. No, what unites us is his spirit comes first. The other thing about this type of transformation is we have to understand that it's very voluntary. It's a spiritual transformation, but it's a voluntary transformation, meaning you have to choose. The verse in 2 Corinthians says, when someone turns to the Lord, or we must continually gaze, right? It, it is, it's our choice to be a part of it. You know, God doesn't force himself on us. Right? God's not up in heaven going, look at me. Hey, look at me. Look at me. Like the parents, you understand. Look at me, right? Look, put your phone down. Look at me, right? You sitting in the couch right now in your pajamas. Put your, no, right? God doesn't work that way. He doesn't say, get our attention and force himself upon us. And in Psalm 37, 4, it says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. See, you have to choose to delight in God. You have to choose to continually gaze upon him. You have to choose to commit everything to him. That's why Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and share a meal with you together as friends. I'm knocking, but it's up to you to open the door. 
If you want that kind of transformation in your life, it is up to you. It's your choice. I see, I think way too many of us, we kind of treat God like a museum visit. I mean, you're going to go see a Rembrandt in a museum and, and you get that opportunity and, and like you, you look at it, maybe you're like me, you look at it for a few minutes, you're like, that's awesome. Go to the next one. That's awesome. Go to the next one. And then you leave. So the type of transformation that's required to really have God transform our lives requires us to stand in one place and be fixated on that. To not leave. To not think that there's anything else worth going to. Like, how could I look at anything else? This is so beautiful. This is so amazing. This is so incredible. I, I just, I have to get pulled away from his presence. I just need to see him and continually gaze upon him and look at him over and over again. And, and the reason most of us would rather leave the museum than stay there and look and look and look, because this type of transformation is also an unraveling transformation. See, when we look at God, God unravels all of us. See, you've heard me say before, receiving Jesus is simple, but following him is never easy because truth unravels us. When we encounter truth, it unravels it. it our lives are so built on emotion. And when we gaze into truth, it, it sh exposes our self-protective psychological framework. I mean, everyone that's, that we're talking right now, right? We're having this, this conversation because what I love is as I'm saying things, I know you're saying things back in your mind, right? We're, we're having this conversation. But all of us, all of you, have a very self-oriented, a self-protective psychological framework. We all do. And when the truth of that is exposed, it can be unnerving. But remember, God loves you right as you are, exactly as you are. But he loves you way too much to leave you that way. He's going to change you. I love Chris Hodges, a pastor um, in Alabama. He says that grace attracts, but truth unravels. Paul hits this several times in Colossians 3, 7. It says, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior, slander and dirty language. And don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. See, we, when you encounter Jesus, when you gaze into his presence, he will unravel everything about you and transform you. Transform the very nature of who you are. Right? Again, this isn't just about making your life better. You don't just get better when you come to church. No, you are absolutely changed. I, I remember when I was a new Christian, I would, when I was younger, man, I, I had a very colorful vocabulary. Let's just maybe put it that way. I, I used a lot of creative metaphors uh, in describing things and situations, and I was good at it. Um, but I remember one particular day, I can still remember, I can remember where I was, what was happening, and where I was going, uh, what the day was like. And I was walking, and in my mind, I'm having a conversation with somebody, as many times people do, and I'm, I'm just letting that person have it. All right, that, it's just, there's just one cuss word after another cuss word going on in my mind. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord just kind of just prompts me and just asks, Brian, why are you doing that? Like, it was that simple of a conversation, but something rattled in me. Something unraveled in me. Absolutely changed me. I was like, wait, God just pointed something out in my life. That, that I need to be different and I need to change. See, what Paul's writing in this passage in 2 Corinthians 3 is that he's writing this at the end of the section and Paul comes to this conclusion. So if you can put all of what I want to talk about today in one sentence, it's this. That if you want the signature of God in your life, you must be willing to continually gaze upon God's glory and go through the process of change. You have to go through the process of change, to keep looking at him and seeing him and knowing that he's going to keep changing. Right? Spiritual living is a journey. It's not a one-time event. It's not like, hey, I come to church, got my little fix, and then go back. No, no. It's a process that God works in us. And those that have been around me for very long, you, you, you'll hear me talk about the process. It's so critical. Because another way that we can say this, and it's not an easy way to say that, but if you are not continually changing... You might not really know God. Like even this week, 
If your life is not different than it was last week, have you really met God? Have you really encountered him? Have you really gazed upon him? Have you really experienced his transformation? What I want us to do is look at that process. What are the things that happen when we continually gaze upon him? Because, my friends, we have to change every week. Every week. I, there, you, every week there's something new that God's working on in your life. And part of the process, we're going to look at just a couple things. And make it really simple. That God's process of change, what he's going to do, is it's going to change our desires. God's presence, when we're in his presence, it's going to change what it is that we want. When we, I think it's the most important thing. People go, how do I know if I've received Jesus or not? If your desires have changed. Remember when I first became a follower of Jesus, I grew up very religious. I grew up around church all the time. But all of a sudden, Jesus became real to me. And I didn't want the things that I wanted before. All of a sudden, I found myself wanting to read the Bible. I was like, I used to be forced to read the Bible, and now I wanted to do it. I hated it before, and now, now I loved it. I, I couldn't stop reading. I, I, I couldn't stop wanting to be at church. I, I couldn't stop wanting to praise. I couldn't stop wanting to just be changed over and over again. Paul writes in Romans 12:2, he says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world, but let God transform you. There's that word again, the metamorphosis, right? To transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think because your spirit changes your thinking. Then you will learn how much, how you will know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You, you're, I've had people say all the time, like, why, why would anyone want to go to church every week? Like, isn't once every six weeks enough? You should want to be in God's presence, not because you got a good band or a decent speaker or any of those kind of things. No, no, because you want to be in his presence. You want to be in his word and you want to worship. And being in his word together like this is a powerful time. And, and the more we're in, the reason we go to church is because it's kind of like a, a masterpiece, right? When God starts painting, it's putting ourselves back up on the easel. And he's saying, God, work on me. Work on me some more. Let me gaze into your presence some more and, and chip some things away and change me even more and more and more. In Philippians 2.13, it says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Who gives you the desire? Is it your desire? No. He gives you the desire. And if we struggle with, with coming to church and even participating together, even online and, and participating in God's word and digging into his word, it's because we're not spending time gazing upon him. Because the more time we spend with him, the more we're going to want to be with him. That's how his presence works in our lives. God gives you the desire, but it's up to you to act on it. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to pray with people as they, they come to an altar and they could come forward. And a lot of times people pray and they'll be, man, I'm just overwhelmed. I don't know what to do or how to chase them, some things. And I just don't feel God's presence in my life anymore. And I always say something that pretty much rattles them. Especially when they say, oh, I just don't feel God's presence in my life right now. I'm like, man, I love it that you're here because that's exactly where God wants you. Because you wouldn't have the desire to even come ask me to pray with you if you didn't have a desire placed in you by God to be with him more. It means he wants to be with you. It means you want to see him and you know him and he's changing your desires. The other thing that God's presence does is it changes what we see. It changes what we see and how we approach things. See, when I grew up, I had a lot of problems with church. I, I didn't like church. I was, like I said, forced to go. In fact, even I vandalized my church that I went to. It's a whole other story. Uh, but but I, I struggled with it. And what I've learned over the years, I'm not the only one that struggles with this. In fact, I've had so many conversations with people that say things that I used to say. Things like, man, I, I, I know the Bible says I shouldn't do these things, but I've prayed about it and I, man, I don't have any guilt over it. So I think God's okay with me doing this. I think it's okay from, from God's perspective that I'm, I'm involved in these things and looking at these things or participating and thinking this way and acting this way. I'm, I'm just, I think God's okay with it. But see, when you encounter Jesus, Jesus changes what you see. 
We don't see things the way that we used to. Look what he says in 1 John chapter 1. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. Or we're not practicing the truth. But if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to be, cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. See, after I come to Jesus, I begin to see my, my own life and I begin to see my own sin more clearly. Now, the more that I'm with Jesus, the more I see how much my sin is affecting me, how, how my own desires, my selfish desires, how much I live from hell up in everything that I do. And I see it more and more clearly every day. In fact, the, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you will deal with your own sin. In fact, the more you'll see it, the, the tears sometimes will be, will be deeper, will be, will, will be more powerful and more profound. She's like, I didn't even see this in my life before. How did I used to think that this was okay? How did I not see that these things are keeping me from seeing Jesus in his fullness? I, I just want to see you, Jesus, more than I've seen you ever before. And, and I can't because now I'm seeing how much of my own sin how much of my own pain, how much of my own issues are getting in the way? Jesus, I want this to change. Like, think of it this way. Like, the longer you're with Jesus, it's kind of like you're outside working at night, maybe in your car or out in the yard, and it's dim, and you look at your hands, and you're like, oh, it's not too dirty. But then you walk inside, right, and your wife or somebody says, will you wash up? Oh, my gosh, you're so dirty, right? The brighter the light, the closer you get to the light, the more you realize how much cleaning you need. The more you realize how much more you need to be cleansed, how much more you need his forgiveness, how much more you need his love. And so if you're in a spot in your life and maybe there are some things that, that, that are, you're facing now and you're like, I didn't see this before. It's because God is dealing with you. I told you, today is going to be, there's, this series is going to be a little raw at times. And I know even sharing these things, there's some of you that, that when you're in a room that's crowded and full of people, you're going to let the tears come. But I believe that there's some things that God is speaking to many of you today, that he wants to bring a cleansing in your life, that he wants to bring you to a deeper place. He wants to bring you to a fuller, just a, a deeper understanding of how much he wants to transform you as you continually gaze at him. I love the fact in 1 John 5, 3, it says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. See, see, we don't do these things, we don't change these things because that's the rules and we have to follow the rules. No, we do it because we love him, because the more we continually see him, the more we just want to see him. Like that's all we want to do is just look at him and see him over and over again. See, you want to change because you love Jesus and you want to be around him more. And you start to realize how your sin and your selfishness keeps you from seeing his glory even more clearly. Another part of the process that God's change does in us is the, that his presence changes what our lives produce. I don't have near enough time to go into this, but I think there are way too many people who are truly not necessarily followers of Jesus, but are moralists. Right? They like Jesus' morals, and they like Jesus' teaching, but their lives aren't producing something different. Right? Until we're changed at the core, until our spirit is continually changed and transformed, goes through that metamorphosis from a caterpillar into that butterfly, and, and really we won't know it, we won't know if we've been changed until hard times come. It's when hard times come that you really understand how much God has changed you. Right? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 says, when, when you followed the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. 
You're, you're going to be sexually immoral. You're going to be impure. You're going to have lustful pleasures. You're going to chase idolatry and sorcery and hostility, uh, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dis- dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and all other thin- sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that if you're living that sort of life, you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. That those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and are crucifying them there. See, the actions that you do are really the fruit that's been growing on, on what's happened previously in your life. What you've planted in your mind, in your heart, and in your emotions. And what, the reason I say you really don't know until hard times come is because when you're squeezed, that's when you're going to find out what you're really made of. When you're squeezed, you're going to see, am I acting like the way that I used to before I knew Jesus? Or is, or is the fruit of joy? and peace, and patience, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and kindness, and, and, and long-suffering, and we forget, like all those things, are those what's coming out just naturally? Or am I trying to force those out? Because when the Spirit of God transforms us, they come naturally. But one of the things I want to encourage you with is you need to remember, even when you plant a tree, it can take five to 15 years before it produces good fruit. It takes a while for these things to be worked out. In fact, most of it, it takes our lifetime. I wish we had a longer conversation to, to jump into that theologically because it takes a lifetime for those things. Some of you might have been walking with Jesus for years and all of a sudden you're dealing with some stuff came out and you're like, where did that come from? And, and, and think of that though as a way, instead of turning away from God, to take, say, God, I want to be in your presence even more. Lord, is this stuff that's coming out of my life is not pleasing. Lord, I want good fruit to come out of my life. So jump back into his presence, gaze upon him, look upon him, be with him, and see powerful things start to take place in your life. Because when we're in God's presence, and the final thing I just want to draw attention to today is God's presence will always change your next step. The Bible is full of incredibly messy people. It's one of the reasons I love reading it. It's so real. It's so real. Every person in scripture is just a mess. And I can relate to the mess. I think you can relate to the mess too. But once they encounter Jesus, their mess no longer determined their future. Yesterday is no longer determined tomorrow. Jesus now determines their tomorrow. I, I think of this in Paul. Paul was somebody who hunted down Christians. He thought he was doing the right thing. In fact, he even gave condolence or kind of gave permission for someone to be stoned and murdered. And Paul was not a good man. But after he found Jesus, look how Paul even introduces himself. In Romans 1.1, he says, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. Man, it's Step by step, Paul started to see himself not as the person that he was before, but as someone transformed by Jesus. That Jesus transformed him, changed him, made something new happen in his life, how he has been changed. Right? It's okay to you, for you to not be okay, but remember, God's not going to keep you that way. He is going to bring transformation into your life that as you gaze upon his presence, or the spiritual transformation that, that's going to uh, unravel some things in you. Something that you have to choose, or you have to choose to walk into it. But the process that's going to happen as you're in his presence is, is he's going to continue just to um, change your desires. It's going to change what you see. It's going to change the things that produce and come out of your life. But we have to look upon him and see it and know it. There's a little girl named... Marina Chapman. She grew up in Colombia, and uh, when she was five years old, she was abducted by some really evil young men who abused her and, and took her out into the jungle and left her for dead. 
And she was there and thought she would die, but she lived. And she thought if she waited there for a while that eventually someone would come and find her. But no one did. And after a couple of days of just waiting there, she heard some rustling and, and, and groups kind of approached her and she looked up to see a little herd of monkey, monkeys. Right? And they came and, and at first they attacked her and they, they hit her and scratched her and they poked her to see who she was. And then they left her alone, but a few, little bit later they came back and they kind of dropped food for her, nuts and berries. And then she ate it and she waited there for a while. And another day they came back again and, and the same kind of pattern happened. So one day she started following them. And as she followed them, she learned to pick up the scraps behind them and, and hang around them and notice when they would shout warnings that she could hide. And, and, and still no one came to find her. In fact, Years later, and you can read all about her. There's a book called The Girl with No Name. It chronicles her story. For years, she lived alone in the jungle just by the monkeys. In fact, she learned to become a tree climber and thought she was a monkey. Lost all of her language, lost all of her clothing. She, she, lost, she just grunted and, and screeched like the monkeys that she did around her. And there was one day when she was about 10 years old. Those are years in the, in the jungle. She saw something sparkly in the, down on the ground. And so she jumps down and she looks and, and she holds up a little object. And as she holds this object up, two eyes stare right back at her and it freaks her out and she drops it and runs away. And so little by little, she goes back and eventually she picks up and what she found was a mirror and had been dropped by someone hiking at one point. And as she began to look in that mirror, she began to realize that she wasn't like the monkeys. She began to realize that there was something different about her. And, and there was an, a discontent that started raising up within her that she was like, I, I'm not like them. There's something different about me. I, 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 I shouldn't be here with them. It started making sense that the more that she looked in that mirror, the more that she saw a, a glimpse of who she really was, of what she was to be compared to whatever, what she thought she had to be in order to survive, things started changing. And my question for you today is as you gaze in God's glory, as you look at him and he looks at you, is there something in you that's dissatisfied with where you are? Are you dissatisfied with what's going on inside of you? Are you dissatisfied with what's taking place? Are you searching for more? Are you starting to catch a glimpse of Jesus and what Jesus can do in your life? That the spiritual transformation that can take place in you. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone and a new life has become. Today, right where you're at, my prayer for you is that you would say in this season, as we're living life totally different than we before. May you have the time and the desire to gaze continually on his face, to let his spirit transform you, to take you through the process. Know that it's going to unravel you, but to have the desire that says, I am made for something more. I'm made for something different. That God, that you would do something deep in my life. And for many of you, God's maybe even just revealing some sin and some different areas in your life that have been dark and have been keeping you from seeing and beholding God. And instead of making it turn away from him, turn towards him. Seek him. Find him. Find a place where you can be with him and allow him to make that change. Allow new fruit to grow in your life. But maybe today is a day that you're just saying, that, Pastor, I just, man, I need that life. I need that kind of life to come alive in me. Jesus said it happens very simply. And all you need to do is we just say, admit that you can't make life happen on your own. That you have a very self-protective psychological framework for your life. The Bible calls that sin. That you believe that Jesus is, he tore that veil. That he is a, a spiritual life available for you that he died on the cross for you so your spirit can be alive forever 
and that you confess with your mouth that you choose, that you choose to be with him, that he makes all things new. So I'd love for you to do is just say a simple prayer like this with me today. Can you do that? Just right where you're at. Can we just pray? And maybe as we're praying that you just open up your heart Maybe today is a day that God's just dealing with you about some things that are keeping you from seeing him more clearly. For you, you just begin to pray, God, forgive me. Change me. Help there be new fruit growing in my life. Let your spirit help me deal with these things that have been keeping me in darkness. God, I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to see your light. I want to see your glory. I want to see your love. Maybe you could pray just a simple prayer like this. Jesus, today I admit that I'm trying to protect myself. I'm trying to make things happen on my own, but I believe today that you died on the cross and conquered death and hell and the grave because you want to give me new life. And so today, Jesus, I choose you choose you. And if you prayed that prayer today, I, I want to help you on this journey. And I want to help you take the next steps in this process. And if, if that's the first time that you pray, like now, if you were listening today and this stirred some things up to you, and maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, but stirred some things, if you email questions at CR First, I would love to be in a dialogue with you. That comes right to me. If you email questions at CR First, so the things that I'll deal with and we'll work together to try to process some things. But if you prayed that prayer today and you want to know what it's like to begin a journey with Jesus, I would love for you to do this. Can you take out your phone? And I'd, I'd love for you just to text uh, just the word life. Take out your phone and text the word life to the number that you're going to see on the screen. It's just 319-313-5310. If you text life to that number, we're, we promise you, we're not going to chase you down or anything. We're just going to give you a next step. And it's up to you to choose to take that next step. And if you text life to that number, we'll help you take that next step. And in each week time, we'll, we'll help you in this process. Because we believe that God is going to do something powerful and beautiful in every one of your lives. So I'm so grateful for each of you today. Thanks for taking time. I, I know it's a, this is a, a lot to kind of weigh through, and, and I didn't want to rush through any of this because I want God's presence to captivate us. I want his signature to be on our lives for each of you to know that you are a masterpiece. Before we go, I'm going to have the, the worship team lead us in, in one last song again. Uh, I want us just to say, God, we want to see your glory. God, we want to lift up our hearts and our lives, and I want to see you. And I want to encourage you to, to stand and to worship him and to let his presence come into our lives. And we just believe that God's power and goodness is going to come and change us. So we pray with me. Father, today, we just give our lives to you. We thank you that you've come to speak to us and move in us. We thank you that you've come to change us and transform us. If this isn't just about getting us better or helping us to live a, a different life, Lord, Lord, you want to transform us completely. Lord, give us a new desire. Give us, God, eyes to see you better. God, give us a new fruit that's producing in our lives and to help us to take step each week to grow and to see you change us. We love you, Jesus. We're grateful for your presence. In your name we pray. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry.
Almighty. He's wonderful and powerful. Amen. I hope you guys have a blessed day and a blessed week. Remember to join us Wednesday night. And for prayer, have a great day.